Hi, my name is Nathan Weisskopf. Welcome back to the Postcards of History YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a uniform showcase where I'll be walking you through all the bits of kit of this impression. So, from the underwear I'm wearing currently, to the, the uniform itself, the trousers and the tunic, to the kit and how to wear it. It's going to be covering the whole nine yards and whether or not you're interested in just learning about the uniform and how they would have worn it, or you're interested in creating it for yourself and maybe joining my uh, reenactment unit that I've founded that focuses on this impression, there should be something for everyone. That being said, let's get right into it. So to quickly just talk you through the pair of trousers I'm now wearing, these are a pair of M16 Universal trousers. In 1916, due to production difficulties and the fact that in the Army there was so much variation in different uniform styles for different types of units, so whether it be you know infantry, cavalry, special units like the Mountain Infantry, a lot of them had different types of cuts of their trousers. In an effort to simplify this, they came up with basically a one-size-fits-all trouser for the entire army. And these would, these trousers would be what were used by everyone in the army for the remainder of the war. Older styles could still be seen later, but they were officially replaced by this style in 1916. So before I show, show myself actually putting them on, I'm just going to give a quick mention to the boots that I will be wearing. These are Austrian Mountain Infantry boots. Uh, really the biggest difference between these and standard Austro-Hungarian Austro low boots is, as you can see, not only do they have the hobnails, but they have cleats along the sides. Now these are obviously, as a result, a little bit heavier, but when fighting in the mountains, the additional traction those cleats provided was obviously worth the trade-off of the weight. I'm actually going to give audio for this bit. I'm uh, interrupting this, maybe breaking the fourth wall a little bit. But I'm going to try to give you a good look on how to wrap these putties properly. Because it took me a long time. Sorry, putties is the correct way to pronounce it. It took me a long time to get my uh, kind of technique down. And while everyone has a little bit of a different way they like to do it, this is how I do it. I go once, completely around tight around the ankle, then about halfway through the second wrap I start going up. And you go up in a few big rolls. Now I tend to like to get around this first button here. I roll over it, and then I go back down. Usually twice if I got the space, then I bring it back up. Actually, really once does it. Then you bring it back up over that little space you got left. And you wrap it. And you want to make sure that you get this piece centered so you can tighten it properly. There's one leg done. You can see full coverage on the back. Now, the unfortunate thing about wrapping puttees, for a guy like me who is all about trying to make it look perfect and get everything even, you are very rarely going to get both wraps even unless you've gotten very good with your technique. I'm still learning. I've gotten it to the point where they properly cover themselves and I can get them tight. But it ends up pretty often where one is a little bit different than the other. As you can see, this leg, you can see the buckle on the front. This one, it's kind of off to the side and it begins on the back. But that's your footwear. That's how you wrap your footwear. Now, I was also going to discuss briefly, and I'll showcase this later. But at the start of the war, the Kaiserschützen wore what were called knee socks. Uh, I don't remember the German, and I'm not going to try to butcher it either. But essentially, they have a small stirrup at the bottom. You'd put your foot in, and now obviously if you look at this, these go higher than my putties, putties go. And what you would do is at the top, you would fold it off, and you would get it about the same height as putties would be worn. But these started to be less and less common late in the war, 
both due to the fact that the material is probably a bit more expensive to use, but also due to the fact that they needed to simplify. So why have a production line open for these when you can simply manufacture these and it gets the job done, right? So to discuss the tunic briefly, like the pants, this is the part of the M16 Universal set. Um, something that can be noted about the Kaiserschützen, Landeschützen, earlier in the war, is they actually had their own special cut of tunic. The big difference, especially for an enlisted man like I'm portraying, is these lower pockets were folded upwards towards the center, so the top part of the pocket angled this way. And they were also a little bit more to the side. And then on the rear, there'd be a pleat that goes straight up the back and for officers they had a small little uh i don't know the exact term for it but it was kind of like a belt in the back that clasped together to make it a little bit more form-fitting but yes as the war progressed the kaiser schutzen found their old uniform being phased out in favor of the universal one now the one thing that distinguishes me as you probably can see is the kaiser schutzen kaiser schutzen at least before material shortages prevented these from being manufactured they would still wear their edelweiss in their collar now they no longer had the large green tabs that they would be wearing at the beginning of the war sometimes a bit ornate but they would still also retain the green strip behind the edelweiss now material shortages didn't completely limit them from being worn just later in the war you can see kaiserschützen uh, and members of the kaiserschützen having tunics that are missing this insignia but for the most part, they would retain it throughout the war. Now, before I get on to the, I wouldn't call it web kit, because there's not really a webbing system with the Austrians, or Austro-Hungarians, rather. But before I get on to that, I will also be showing you the last piece of kit that was made universal. The so-called Feldkappe. Now, once again, at the beginning of the war, the Kaiserschützen had their own style of Feldkappe. The... Big distinguishing factor is the brim, or not brim, the top of the cap was a little bit taller than you can see here now. And the neck curtain, actually, there were two buttons in the front, but there was actually no functioning neck curtain. It was purely for show. Now, obviously, I've retained my feather. And once again, like the Edelweiss, that would be sometimes seen in later in the war. Sometimes it wasn't. It just really depended on if the soldier had been in the war for a while, so they had, they had been issued them earlier. Uh, you know, new conscripts would be the ones that would usually be seen without both the feather and the Edelweiss, because they would just be given whatever the store depot has. Um, as well with the field cap, you can see I'm wearing a pair of mountain goggles. This was pretty common, but it wasn't, this actually, this practice wasn't actually exclusively limited to the Kaiser system. There were other, other parts of the army that would wear their snow goggles, or uh, glacier goggles. There are a lot of different styles, really, actually. Um, but they would wear them around the field cap like this. They would tie it around the back. And then, obviously, when you needed to use them, you would take them off, put them over your eyes, and when you're done, you put them back up. To speak on this model, actually, this model I had custom reproduced because you, it's hard to find originals. Um, and... If you're thinking about making this impression yourself, you don't necessarily need to go the full nine yards and get the custom reproduced ones because it was a bit of a hassle and there's really uh, there's one guy who I'll be linking in the description who made them for me. But you can get away with using German World War II snow goggles because they looked pretty similar to one of the models the Austrians used. Uh, and, you'll, and you'll still get the, the appearance of being a mountain infantry when wearing your snow goggles. So with that being said, let's move on to the fun part your leather kit, or rather your pouches, your bayonet, your shovel, etc. So I had originally filmed uh, an explanation of every individual piece of this kit as I put it on while I was putting on, but it was a bit long, so instead I'm opting to show you as it's done, and I'm going to walk you through every piece briefly and with a little bit more detail. So, the belt I'm wearing currently is the M15 style roller buckle belt. They had another style of belt that they used that used a brass belt buckle with the double-headed eagle. But as the war went on and material shortages became more prevalent, 
they started ditching that belt because they didn't want to make the belt buckle anymore. So the roller buckle style became more common. Now even these, they would often manufacture them in linen or canvas actually, because they didn't even want to use the leather on the belt. So that's the belt. Uh, I have the leather version because I like the leather and I like how it looks. But there are many people that make the so-called ersatz versions that'd be completely acceptable to be using in a late war impression. Now your ammo pouches, all throughout the Austro-Hungarian army, any any type of infantry formation, unless it was a special formation like the stormtroopen, uh, stormtroopen, they use these double pouch M1895 Mon Liquor pouches. Um, each pouch, they're they're double pouches, but they have two pouches each. Each pouch holds two end, two clips, which is ten rounds. So 20, 20 rounds for each pouch, 40 rounds in total. You would also carry additional ammunition in your rucksack, or if you were earlier in the war, your tornister. Moving on to the side, you have the bread bag or haversack, the shovel and the shovel carrier, the bayonet and the bayonet frog, and the gas mask can. Now I will say that later in the war, especially during combat, you can see in photos of them not wearing the haversack. It's not super common, and they often did, but sometimes I ditch it when I'm talking to the public and doing displays. The bayonet, fro the bayonet, bayonet frog, and the shovel carrier were worn in the so-called German style, where you poke the tip of the bayonet sheath through the shovel carrier, so they kind of stay together as one piece. Now, the gas mask can is an Austro-Hungarian design, and you can differentiate it between from the German gas mask cans because you can see it's kind of got this tapered bottom. But it fits a German style mask. This is the model 1915. I think it's called the Gumi mask. And while Germany imported a lot of these to Austria, or rather exported a lot of these to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, later in the war they did actually get domestic production going of licensed copies. And the last piece of kit that you would often see later in the war is, of course, the iconic Stahlhelm. Now, to talk about this Stahlhelm briefly, under this cover you have a reproduction of a Austrian, or, yeah, an Austrian M17 Stahlhelm. So it was still, it still appeared like a German shell, but the main difference was that these chin straps were mounted a bit higher. The Austrians also used cloth chin straps and the liner was also a bit different as well but as i said it's covered by the cover so i can't show you the rivets and it was also common practice for the austro-hungarians to use this style of cover with the helmet now if i wasn't wearing the cover they would often be painted a sort of reddish brown that you can see here uh, i did this paint job myself i got this color so it's not perfect but it's about it's pretty close um but they often were worn with the covers. So if you find an acceptable reproduction and the paint job is terrible and you can't necessarily source the best colors, it is fine to cover it and just do your best to hide the bad paint job. Now, obviously with reenacting, your goal should always be making it accurate, but especially since I'm discussing from the perspective of my group, as the unit leader, while I, I mean, a very big stickler for authenticity and not getting these things wrong. I understand that everyone starts somewhere, and especially if you're new, I'm trying to be lenient uh, and allow people to get the most out of the group while also maintaining authenticity. Um, with that being said, you can probably see I've stacked them up behind me, and I'm going to quickly move on to the weapons. Now, since I'm holding the mic for better audio quality, I'm not going to be able to show you the rifles as best as I'd like, but so be it. So first of all, a rifle that a lot of people will end up using because you can find them easy and they're cheap, and the Kaiserschützen also use them. Actually, fun fact, the reason I ended up doing this impression is I bought this rifle first, and then I found out that the general infantry didn't really use the carbines all that much. With the exception of, say, machine gun crews uh, or specialist formations like the Sturmtruppen. So, these are acceptable. These are the so-called Stutzens. 
But in the end, especially if you're interested in doing other Austro-Hungarian impressions, you should really try to find you one of these. This is a Monlicker 1895 long rifle. It is pretty long, you can see. That's sitting on the ground. It comes up to about a little bit above my stomach. Um, and you can see that with my rifle I'm using... This is, this is the official mountain sling. This is what mountain infantry would use. And to note on a nice function of the uniform, since I'm talking about the rifle, you have this handy little thing called a shoulder roll. And really all it does is if you have your rifle shouldered and you want your hands free, your rifle doesn't slip off your shoulder. In all honesty, I don't know why more armies didn't use these things, because I've found it pretty useful when I'm talking to people and I want to keep my rifle shouldered. With all that being said, that's kind of the, the kit to show. Um, I'm going to give you a quick spin around so you can see the uniform uh, completed, and I'll also give you an angle spinning around where you can see the boots. But with that, all that being said, I'm going to do that, and then I'll move into the closing statements. So, that's really everything I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this look at a late war Kaiserschütz in uniform. If you're interested in joining my unit, I'll leave the unit link in the description as well as the email to reach out to me. And if this has spiked your interest in joining the unit, I'm glad and I, that's really what I made the video for. If you're just interested in some of the history or, or seeing the uniform, I hope I gave you a, a good overview. And I hope you look forward to more videos like this in the future. To give a general idea of the next uniform showcases that I will be doing, I'm going to leave one a surprise because it's kind of going to be one of the first of its kind. But uh, later this year, I should be finishing up a Kaiserschützen officer impression, which is really going to be a lot of the same stuff you see here. But obviously, my tunic is going to be a bit nicer. Uh, I'll be showcasing the mountain saber. Uh, and I might even be showing off one of the Austrian uh, handgun styles they used, if I can get my hands on one. Uh, but other than that, uh, future, uh, the future beyond that is going to be probably an early war Landeschützen impression. So still the Edelweiss and Sigdian and whatnot, but showing off some of the early war differences I talked about early, earlier in the video. Uh, possibly an aviator impression. I'll be doing a mountain assault patrol impression, so a lot, basically, what you see here, but with lots of grenades and uh, bladed weapons. Uh, and beyond that, who knows what the future holds? I I kind of got a lot of uh, on my plate, as you can see now, and I hope it keeps you engaged and keeps you interested for more. So as always, I thank you for visiting the Postcards of History YouTube channel. I hope you've enjoyed your time here, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much, and you have a great day.